Hello and welcome to the 2022 Digital Foundry Annual Graphics of the Year discussion. I am here as always, and I am joined by just one of my fellow members because he's the only one that had time to join in, <laughs> and that's Alex Battaglia. It's funny, I'm the only one who had time, but I also had no time. No one has time anymore. Time's yeah, we're, gone. We're, it's a concept at this point. The uh, end of the year is always a chaotic time, but everybody has weighed in on this list. We've shared it and discussed it amongst all of us, and we've come to an interesting conclusion, I suppose. We've selected 10 games, 10, plus uh, sort of a runner-up at the last minute there that we're going to throw in at the another, number 11 slot, and then all of those games, the first seven or eight, are going to be completely out of order, just pure discussion pieces, but as we did before, uh, the top three is numbered and very carefully selected. Uh, there will be some upsets, but we'll see how it goes. <laughs> and we also have a special surprise category wedged in between the top three and the rest of the game. So, Alex, are you ready to get into this? I'm so psyched. And I'm going to start it off, John, because you've been so nice in introducing this video. But this is one that both you and I have looked at. Uh, this is our runner-up and or honorable mention category here, and this goes to The Witcher 3 Complete Edition, uh, which is now out on next-gen consoles, and of course on PC, which is the version that you and I took the look at and spent the most time with, and the one we were suitably most impressed with. And for me, uh, the reason why I really like the Complete Edition uh, visually is because it kind of remedies nearly all of the core visual faults that I had with the original The Witcher 3. Um, I always had a big problem with the way the game like shaded grass and or the way it uh, did any of its global illumination. Like back in the day when the downgrade a or whatever it was called happened in, well, I don't know when that came out. When was that? That trailer came out. Oh, geez. Oh, God. It was like the two I don't even remember at this point. It's called at this point. But, but yeah, it was a very different looking game at the time. Very different looking game. So they had to like, quote unquote, downgrade the game to make it open world, to make it run on consoles of that time. But RTXGI and RTAO, it looks so much better now. And the, the added reflections and uh, ray tray shadows, in spite of some of the issues with those shadows there, um, it's it's a, a lot better looking game. But it doesn't fix everything, right, John? That's why it's not on the core list here. Yeah, and this one kind of came in late after our initial discussions <laughs> yes. as well. But I felt it was worth a mention because, yes, it does look phenomenal. It fixes so many things. The GI is a huge game changer, but of course, uh, I love the RT reflections because I always felt the water was rather uh, poor looking. Yeah, I'm uh, not a fan the either. New, the new foliage, I think, is great. It looks a lot better. Forests feel more dense, but like you say, it's not perfect because uh, it's extremely heavy right now, and I think there's definitely some optimization issues, <laughs> possibly down to some of the developmental challenges they ran into. Yeah. Uh, sometimes, you know... If you look into it, you'll see it wasn't the smoothest development cycle for numerous reasons, but needless to say, or actually maybe there is a need to say it, <laughs> the game has extremely heavy CPU requirements to the point where there really isn't a CPU out there, as far as I'm aware, that can just run this bad boy at max settings with ray tracing enabled at 60 frames per second without relying on frame generation, yeah. which is a godsend in this case, by the way. It is a real godsend, <laughs> but you know... That's, you know, that's our honorable mention. One that could have made the list if it had a bit more polish and or also wasn't t technically tied to the legacy baggage that The Witcher 3 has. It's a, the, Witch the Witcher 3 is a bit old now and it kind of shows through. Um, yeah, for sure. It shows through. But Alex, yeah. that, that's enough of the runner up. It got some highlight. It's a good looking game now, though it has those baggage issues, of course. But let's talk about the actual list here, starting with not numbered 10. But our first game on the <laughs> unordered <top> list. <laughs> uh, yeah, on the unordered list. Uh, and we went with Dying Light 2 from Techland. Dying Light 2, beautiful first person zombie survival action platform game. I don't know what to call it. I like Dying Light 2 a lot. Yeah. It's a beautiful game. And when I talk about it here, I am especially referring to the PC version. But honestly, I think all versions of Dying Light 2 deserve a mention because, you know, Firstly, before we even talk about the graphics, I'd like to say that Dying Light 2 shipped in a pretty good state. It mm -hmm. wasn't perfect at launch, right? There were definitely some issues, uh, but it was a lot smoother than most of the other <laughs> games that would ship throughout the year that we tested. It was solid from the beginning, oh, a little heavy, but you know, for what it's doing, I think that's understandable. 
Uh, and most importantly, Techland has shown that they're willing to support their games for a very long time. They've continued to update the game, add features, just do so much to it. There's a lot of content on the way. That is something that I think deserves a lot of kudos. I suppose their fellow Polish studio, CD Projekt Red, is kind of in a similar boat, Usually, except yeah. for their releases <laughs> don't launch in the best of states. <laughs> Uh, but Alex, I think the the big thing for this one, it's the ray tracing, isn't it? Oh yeah, it's the full package. It's kind of like what we just got with The Witcher, but even more intense because it's like oh, yeah. per pixel ray trace global illumination. Um, there's ray trace shadows as well, ray trace reflections. You know, they have also like local GI from your flashlight bounce and yep. a whole bunch of other things as well in there too. And the game has a dynamic time of day, which we've, we're going to talk about it multiple times in the studio probably, but mm. we, you know, like conceptually, I loved the way it was used in something like Crisis back in the day. But dynamic time of day, when it is used in an open world game, tends to, um, due to limitations of rasterization technology and things like that, open world lighting is pretty limited, except when you do it in a way that kind of like limits how actually dynamic it is. Uh, or and or keep your scope down or you know there's a ways to mitigate it with art but if you're going for that full look it's hard to do and i think the the rasterized lighting in this game when you know you don't play with rtgi it looks okay but then you flip on that rtgi switch and wow it like starts making a lot of views that you see almost photorealistic beyond some of the assets and things like that just in terms of the way the light is interacting with the materials in the scene and the way it kind of bounces around corners or the, the added in shadow it adds in. And it does so much for this game. Yeah. And I, I would say though, that their rasterized lighting is actually quite good. It's, it's more a matter of precision, I guess, with the ray trace global, global illumination, it really kind of fills in all the small little areas and nooks and crannies and spills in naturally through the window, bouncing around the room. And just, you're right. It gives it this almost photorealistic look at times, uh, and that's on top of the fact that the game itself is one extremely detailed, the amount of geometry in any scene and just the density of the environments is genuinely impressive. Uh, the post-processing stuff is done super well. They have excellent motion blur with a nice long shutter speed. So when you're tearing through the city at full speed, swinging off of uh, signposts, <laughs> it actually has this like sense of momentum to it as a result of that motion blur that I think looks amazing. And, you know, it's just, it's generally just a gorgeous, beautiful game and it's also served as well i think as a benchmark on the pc side as well completely as a result like you know that, yeah. that intro stage as well as some of the parts in the later part of the game when you get in the city are really heavy um it's been really great on pc and you know shipped with like dlss and you're like saying their long-term support of this game shipped with fsr1 because fsr1 was what was out at the time but then when fsr2 came out they updated the game to include fsr2 as well as on the consoles uh, there yeah, exactly. too. So you got like a much higher uh, perceptual resolution there on the consoles in the end over time. And that's something we really like to see. And they're always sporting new tech. The fact that this launch with RTGIs and RG reflections and all these things is amazing. And as a part of that, we're going to say it a couple times in this video as well too. I know just based on the list, but yeah, custom tech, this is their yep. C engine. What is it called? C engine. C engine. That's what it's called. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, in the age of everyone and their mother, father, brother, sister, and whoever. <laughs> and uh, Richard. And Richard. Uh, switching. Yeah. Richard <laughs> is now running on Unreal Engine 5. That's right. Um, everyone's switching to Unreal. Or I guess if you're into, you know, some Unity titles in there too. But I really like seeing custom tech. It's interesting to see what people do trying to solve the same problem or maybe even different problems because they're game types. So I like seeing that. And also it just runs pretty well in spite of the fact that it is a custom engine, you know, because yeah, the shader compilation stutter is not a huge issue in this title. Not a huge issue in this title. Unlike which otherwise. Great. So it's good. Which is <laughs> actually surprising when you consider the scope and complexity of the environment. It seems like a game that would have really bad shader compilation <laughs> stutter, but it doesn't. <laughs> Uh, and you mentioned Unreal, by the way, there's only two games on this list that are powered by Unreal. Yeah, right. And uh, those are cream of the crop, I'd say. For sure, but for sure. I think with that said, we should probably move on to the next game. Yeah, and I'll introduce this one for you, John. Uh, this is one that I have had so little experience with that I can barely talk about it, but it is definitely deserved on this list. And that is Need for Speed Unbound. John, tell me about this game. So I wanted to highlight this one because I felt it was a beautiful demonstration of the still relevant Frostbite engine, which uh, is actually a surprisingly great fit for this game. 
Need for Speed has been in a rough place over the past few years, and I feel like the last... So Need for Speed 2015 was actually beautiful, but mm-hmm. after that, the next two titles, I feel, really missed the mark. This Gosh. one, though, returns to a lot of the lighting and, and material qualities that we saw in 2015, but amps everything up. Uh, it has more variability in terms of times of day, but they smartly opted not to do real time, and this is actually tied to the gameplay, but you have a daytime and a nighttime, and each of those has a fixed have different fixed baked versions of themselves right sometimes you'll have like at dusk sometimes you'll have you know midday different weather conditions and the lighting here for being rasterized uh it has a nearly photorealistic look at times that reminds me of like an evolution of what we saw in like assassin's creed unity right where really strong material work all the cement uh you know the asphalt the metal everything just feels very surprisingly realistic and racing through that with the long shutter motion blur man it just feels unbelievable at times and on top of that they layer it with the once controversial but i think it actually looks quite good sort of cartoon effects right so like smoke particles some of the other little fancy things they kind of overlay this into the world or actually render out in like a 3D cell shaded style. And that includes characters. So it almost has this initial D style presentation where you've got the more 3D cars with uh, animated characters. And there's even pedestrians in the world, which is interesting. That's unusual for Need for Speed as of late. Uh, But I've been playing this on PC. I was really impressed with how I was able to run it straight away no shader comp stutter, uh, 120 <laughs> frames per second, maxed out setting. Powerful. I'm on a powerful system. I, I know. I, it, I know. It's good. 120 frames per second, maxed out details, 130 percent resolution scale with the native TAA. Not even using the upscaling features, which, by the way, it does have FSR2 and DLSS. So, uh, which is very helpful for you know lower tier graphics cards. The CPU utilization seems perfectly fine. Um, it just it just screams and not only that it's also 60 frames per second on consoles mm. so this beautiful open world racer 60 fps across the board i think criterion which this is their first need for speed game since most wanted in 2012 oh god it's so long deserves a lot of credit for this like they really i think they finally dialed in the formula it's built on what ghost games which is loosely related to them did with uh heat but i think the actual progression and the way everything plays out is significantly improved and more polished and it sort of realizes that concept in a way that i found more fun and yeah it's a beautiful game which is why i felt i wanted to put it on this list i'm sure people are confused but (laughs) seriously go look at this game running it's awesome looking seriously smoothness is a huge part of graphics john um yeah so like man like when we did put this list together we were very acute to like talk think about the fluidity of the graphics that we're seeing here like and things that aid fluidity as well too so um yeah it definitely deserves a spot Absolutely. on this list uh this next one john this is one oh, that yeah. we probably would have never put on this list ever except things changed right yes indeed alex this is one that i never in a million years thought would be on this list um i guess it should have been something we considered <laughs> when you know who developed it we're talking about Fortnite from epic games this game recently got an update to unreal engine 5.1 utilizing all the new features that they've been talking about for two more than two years now you know you got lumen you got nanite you got virtual shadow maps you got their new tsr all that stuff is right in the game and my goodness was it transformative it's huge like this game they had a dynamic time of day for whatever reason i mean i don't really I don't know, know about why. the gameplay reason why it does but it does and the original game using unreal engine 4 essentially is like basic dynamic lighting system has super basic like global illumination it was probably actually due to the save the earth or save the world mode that oh, they, yeah. Fortnite was originally architected around which did have a day night cycle so they probably just were like yeah we'll just let's we'll leave it, it. <laughs> we'll just leave it <laughs> in um and as a result though of them changing over to lumen uh both in its software and hardware mode here we're talking about it changes the game so much <laughs> where john's video that he did on this covering uh primarily the, uh, the game on console but it had some pc input in the, as well too just like the side by sides that john did 
or any of the scrolling camera work where John's just like looking at like an underpass and a bridge or something like that. It makes the game take on that visual fidelity, not completely so, but like it's reminiscent of it, of like a pre-rendered animated movie in terms of the way the light is bouncing around the scene. Things that your eyes expect. Uh, and it enhances the ca- cartoony look, I would say. I think it makes it even look more like a cartoon than it did before. No. I mean, that's the magic behind stuff like the Pixar uh, movies and all the other pre-rendered shows out there. They have access to this pre-calculated, but basically path-traced lighting. We're not getting full path tracing here, mind you, but I do think this demonstrates the capabilities of Lumen, especially in a performant environment where they're targeting 60 frames per second on consoles, no less. It's shockingly effective. And yeah, it's just, it's one of those things where you can just like zoom the camera into just random spots on the map and just sort of marvel at the way light sort of behaves. It, it's really, really, truly remarkable and transformative because honestly, without it, I do think the game is pretty ugly. Like the, the <laughs> default, like sort of gray, silvery lighting that you have yeah, right. on, the, on the specular and in indirect areas is it's very, it makes rooms look bland. Like I think that that one house is a great example where you walk up to it. It's the light is bouncing into the porch and sort of bouncing up right to the ceiling and all the, the scaffold and everything. And then you go inside and you get the kitchen where the sunlight's just pouring in through the window. And in the original version, it's just like gray, but with Lumen, uh, it's properly illuminated. You can actually feel the sunshine warming up the room. It's, it's so impressive. Plus, uh, you get ray traced reflections as well, which is nice basically. So, uh, it, not on series S though, there, there were some compromises made there, but still, uh, all in all, when you consider how transformative it was for, from a visual perspective, and then look at how performant it is as well, including on low powered platforms. I mean, I believe Rich even had this running in the steam deck. Yeah, he did. With So, uh, so <laughs> You know, given all that, I think Epic Games did a phenomenal job and they deserve a lot of kudos for for doing this. And I think this is specifically an example of what Unity needs so bad. They need a game that is shipped to serve as their test bed. Yeah. To be able right. to implement features that they're adding to their engine and basically show that they can be shipped in a stable, complete game. And I think this type of exercise gives Epic a huge advantage in this space. And I'm sure a lot of developers are very pleased to see the, the progress they've made since first announcing it. So yeah. Yeah. Fortnite. 100%. And once again, the power of ray tracing. When when Turing RTX was announced, oh my gosh, like four, more than four years ago at this point, right? Um, we were psyched and we knew what ray tracing was and why we wanted it to come to video games finally. And now we're seeing it in action in big games. So power to the ray tracing. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. We have a next one though, and uh, this is another non Unreal based game. So, Fortnite was our first Unreal Engine based game on the list. If you're counting. Uh, this next one though is from our good buddies at Asobo Studio, and it's a Plague Tale Requiem. I thought this game was freaking phenomenal looking. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, Just there, wow. There's a lot of things to talk about here, but. Um, Kind of image cohesion is one thing. It is a completely uh, linear adventure. It's a stealth stealth action game is the way I would describe it. Um, yeah. Kind of, but a lot of stealth. A lot of stealthing around. But just the, ge- the way the game intros you into it, like you're constantly moving down a funneled corridor, yes, but the vistas that you're given in this game are incredible. It's one of the first times I think we've seen maybe beyond another game on this list that we'll be talking about later, where I feel like the power of these current gen consoles was really put to bear in how much geometry and detail was put into the world. Um, there's so many Vista shots, like the opening one, when you get to the city and you're like peering off the, the pier there, looking at the bay below, or when you get into that shanty town inside the uh, former arena, the stadium there, and like they just, the camera pans out, and you can see like all of the like detail in the world. Just incredible how much they put in this game. And it's not even using ray tracing. And I think the lighting looks really, really good here. Um, yeah. John, what do you have to all say about th- it? It's fixed time of day, of course, which gives them an advantage uh, uh, in that each environment is lit a specific way. And the artists really did an amazing job with each and 
every area. And there's a surprising amount of variety. I mean, you'll be fighting through some storms and of course you have the sunny beaches and everything in between. But yeah, you mentioned those vistas, which are super impressive, especially in terms of LOD management, which is surprisingly robust. Uh, you're able to move across there very smoothly without a lot of noticeable popping, but also on the, uh, the close proximity level, the objects and items that are scattered near the player, uh, are just superbly detailed. All the little rocks and pebbles that are just beautifully rendered, uh, all the different materials, the metals, you know, all this, I'm such, I have such a, uh, a fondness for well-rendered metal yeah, for some reason. Too. It's just, it's, it's so beautiful and they really do it wonderfully here. Yeah. It's like all uh, hammered out and great. And, yeah. and once again, you like, you introduced it as well too. uh, custom technology, uh, for the longest time, both the last game and this game, when you would go online and hear people talking about it, they would almost just assume it's unreal engine. Yeah. No, it is not. Uh, it is which, not. which is good, at least for this title in a lot of ways, but it's also just really impressive how, uh, you know, Unreal and stuff, um, they ship with all these tools to, to do all these things like, um, performance capture, uh, animation, like crowds, etc. We're seeing this all from a studio who otherwise, you know, with a much smaller budget is putting out these visuals that people are thinking that it is Unreal Engine. That says a lot about what they're putting out there. Uh, it is of such high quality, and, and I, I think they deserve so much. Both this, their last game, as well as um, Microsoft's uh, Flight Simulator Flight 2020, Simulator, yeah. which is also just mind-bogglingly good-looking. Uh, so this studio, I would really love to see what they who would are do. these guys, man? Yeah, who, who, what are they doing? <laughs> what do they eat for breakfast? I want to know. Um, I would love to see them uh, given an even big, bigger budget, uh, either for the next game in this series or for another game they want to make entirely... Uh, you know, to just like iron out some of the things as well as just see what they could do w with that tech, right? I think you can kind of see some of the limits of the budget creep through a little bit with the character performances. Like yeah. The actual model quality uh, and the way they're rendered is ex exceptionally high quality. But, you know, the animation work, while good, doesn't quite, you know, reach the, the, the best we've seen in these sort of genres and such. And that, I think, is usually a function of budget. So... I would also love to see what they could do with a little bit more cash. And hopefully after these recent successes, they'll receive just that. I imagine them. Uh, <laughs> but let's move on to our next title. And this is one that, so just as you had not played much of Need for Speed Unbound, I have not played much of this, but after watching your video and seeing some of this in action, I agree with its place in, placement on the list. And it's also not unreal. It's, Warhammer 40k Dark Tide. Dark Tide. Yes, I wanted to put this on the list because I feel it is a um kind of a perfect translation of what was originally um, you know, 2D art drawings or little 3D models and bring that entire like atmospheric world that is described via text and putting it into actual 3D visuals where you can navigate around an environment. Things that were just lore and fiction beforehand now are now actually real 3D environments with like sound, incredible atmospheric effects, and you know, a first person perspective and all the detail that it, you know, that requires. And this game absolutely nails it. It's basically like the perfect translation of Warhammer 40K's visuals to me. And the way they nailed it is both on the small scale and on the large, like macro concepts. Like on the small scale, right. like when you get up into it and you look at things, you can see like all the greebly details on like everything, like the the bolts, the rivets, uh, the little screws, all the little indentations from like parallax uh, occlusion mapping or parallax mapping. And then you scroll out a bit and you can see like the way the larger environments take shape with like huge halls with like filled with statues or like, you know, smelting chambers and things like that. All like with this cool as heck gothic architecture uh, that Warhammer 40k is known for. And tying it together is that this is, it's not expected, I think. This is a custom, uh, this is a custom engine here, but they kind of went really far into using ray tracing. Um, even if you don't turn it on, they use RTX GI's uh, baked probes to do the baked lighting in the game. But, you know. It's really cool. Yeah, it's like when you kind of, like the RTX GI just, and with the ray trace reflections, they add a lot 
to the dynamic lighting in this game because it takes place primarily in dark environments, like really enclosed dark environments where you're only like lighting ahead with a flashlight usually or a floodlight or maybe some sconces on the wall or something like that. Um, and whenever like your muzzle flares with like a flash, like you can see it reflected in the reflections in the GI. You can also see like shadows emanate from your gun's muzzle flash oh, yeah. and the flashlights of your teammates. It's basically a, like a real time lighting show as you, as this is going down, and it makes the gameplay so much more tense as a result. Gives me a bit of flashbacks at times to something like Natural Selection Two or Doom Three, where those games also focused a lot on their real time lighting technology when they came out to enhance the atmosphere of playing the game. Uh, one was multiplayer, one was single player, and this one is like a combination of the two since it's a co op game primarily, and you know. Uh, it's really, really good. I wish it was shipped a little bit more polished <laughs> because it has, uh, the reason why yeah, it's not further well. down on this unordered list that is completely unordered and I have no idea why I'm talking about it again. But the reason why <laughs> it's not in the top three, for example, is because, you know, like the fluidity of the game is, uh, compromised, uh, due to some hitching that occurs, I felt. And it, you know, it was obvious when I was playing the game and it really was a downer. Um, so that's the only reason why I wouldn't want to put it further down the list, but I love it. I can't wait to play some more of it. I can't wait to see what they add to it because, you know, in blog posts talking about the game, they're like, our ray tracing is foundational technology for us. We're going to look to see if we can use it for things like shadows in the future or transparency reflections. So I'm watching you, Fat Shark. You make good stuff. I want to see what you do next. They, they have for a long time. Fat Shark, I think, was spun off from Grin. Yes, right. In Sweden, which made some amazing stuff, such as Bionic Commando Rearmed. Uh, and they always worked with their own technology. I'm glad to see that they're still doing so, basically. So, yeah, that's cool. I need to play this sometime. It is a beautiful game. We'll have to check it out. Maybe a co-op uh, game one day for, like, DF play. But, okay. That could, that could be fun. So, next uh, game is one that I actually haven't spent much of any time at all with. But due to John's video on this, as well as just, I think, everything about this game, it is 100% deserved position on this list in spite of what you in the comments may say right now. And that is The <laughs> Last of Us Part 1, John. Take it away, yes. Johnny. O Oliver and I were pulling for this one. Uh, Tilu, as he'd call it. Uh, yeah, so this one actually really impressed me because when it was announced that they were remastering The Last of Us, uh, I, like many others, was extremely skeptical. It felt like something that wasn't really necessary. Uh but after actually seeing it for myself, and I do understand the price complaints. Those are certainly valid. But the quality of the workmanship on display here is genuinely impressive. This is a truly beautiful game that fixes so many of the rendering flaws that were basically the result of shipping this original game on PlayStation 3, <laughs> right? Uh, they're able to take things so much further. And it's now based on the technology powering The Last of Us Part II, uh, but it also pushes further than that, I would say. And this is probably the best-looking game to come out of Naughty Dog, even though Naughty Dog themselves was not the sole uh, developer on this project. I believe Santa Monica also was involved. There's been a lot of discussion over remaster, remake, these different terms, and I always like to refer to this one as a visual re remake. Because although it shares a lot with the original game design, like a lot, all of the visuals have been completely remade from scratch and it looks significantly different and better. The big change, I think, is their lighting model. You know, on PS3, they did some very impressive work with indirect lighting for the time uh, on a system that's not really well suited to that sort of thing. <laughs> it has but, like no memory. So like, yeah. Right. <laughs> so, but obviously, you know, it still looked pretty good for the time, but we've come a long way since then. Naughty Dog has come a long way. The Last of Us Part Two really showcased what they could do, and this one it takes it even further. And you just combine that with the excellent materials work again, and you have these scenes that really just feel so much more realistic and natural uh, to the eye, right? It really, really works well. And character detail as well. I mean, this is a character-driven game, a narrative-heavy game, and when you compare just like Joel's facial features and, you know, his outfit, his coat, his backpack, all of the stuff between them, uh, it's really pretty absurd how much more detailed everything is now. 
and it animates so well too uh both yeah, within really well not as pro- like in gameplay it's technically still a little bit uh there's like some design constraints there from the original last of us that sure. bleed through but like in terms of like animation blending as well as um just facial performance capture like naughty dog at some point switched over to performance capture and i actually think it like aided their game so much like yeah in terms of just like driving the performances uh not making them over exaggerated and things like that but just like when when you see like joel emote in this game or any of the side cast and the side cast looks Bill. incredible too Bill. yeah right <laughs> like all of the it's one of those games where it's like really hard to even want like you technically could but there's almost no reason to to pick pick out flaws in like the character performances and things like that because it is one of the first times in games we've seen character performances where you're just like yeah that's the person doing something it, it's really good looking in terms of that and mm-hmm. incredible kudos to the studio for doing this right um i just thinking back about when it was announced and the first footage came out it also goes to show how uh marketing and also commentating online can just be very wrong and or deceiving like people were really convinced that this looked like the exact uh like the first game like mm-hmm. they were like oh my gosh they've barely changed it and they're re-releasing again for x and x money and but honestly your video john just should have probably shut up every single naysayer out there it is a way well, better looking game than the original. it's more that i felt like uh, the way this was marketed really did a bad job at showcasing what it brings to the table uh I don't think comparisons with cutscenes were, were necessarily were the right way to go because first of all, the cutscenes in the original version were pre-rendered FMV, <laughs> so they were more detailed than what was being done in real time. So, and on PS5, everything is now real time, which is something they I feel that they should have communicated better. But then, just more side by sides with the, with the game environment, I think would have really helped people understand how much it has actually improved. Right. I mean, there's just so many little details too. Like when you're inside that one building, there's like this bunched up carpet that sort of moves and reacts to, to your foot placement. And it's just like, they didn't have to do that, but it's there. And there's so many of those little tiny details there that really, really stand out. John, can, uh, can you flush a toilet in this game? I really need to know. Actually, you probably can't because it's the apocalypse. Yeah, no. I don't think there's any running water or not much in this <laughs> world, so uh, I, I'm not sure that would have worked. Yeah, but... back, back in the old days, that was the test of whether or not a game was good, whether you could flush toilets. So. Exactly. Just skip ahead to nine minutes in my video <laughs> and check out that little segment on Bill, and I feel like that you'll be like, oh, okay, I understand why it's on this list. Yeah, it totally is. <laughs> uh, but uh, should we move on to the next one? Yeah, sure, John. Uh, so this is another one that I also haven't played uh, really, other than watching John's content on it, I'm waiting for another version of it that might be coming out at some point in the future, and that is mm. Gran Turismo 7. John, why is it on uh, this list? GT Zeebin. <laughs> <laughs> so, I've always been a fan of uh, the work Polyphony Digital does in the visual space. Um, they did have some rough patches on the PlayStation 3, I would say. But uh, they came back to form with GT Sport, but GT Sport was somewhat content limited in some ways. And Gran Turismo 7 is essentially taking what they built with GT Sport and expanding it out to the scope of a proper Gran Turismo game, which they've done. And uh, they made a lot of improvements to it over GT Sport, I think, especially on the new tracks, which were not in that version. And... I think they continue to showcase that they're just the best in the business when it comes to lighting and then just the quality of their their vehicle simulation, like the individual details that they get right on every single car that's modeled. There's a lot of games with realistic licensed cars, but I think like the 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 most convincing thing is you look at just the way they handle things like paint surfaces and the different layers with the clear coat and all the different layers to the paint, the way the light penetrates that, the way they handle like plastics and leather in the cockpit, all the different displays within the cars. It really feels like they paid such close attention to that, that it ends up looking shockingly realistic at times. And it's, it's super impressive. I think they're really the best in the business when it comes to like, uh, car material shading, uh, not just the details, but you know, like really getting the fact that it like paint like that metallic paint with the multi-layers should look like 
the way it does in this game. And your video highlighted that incredibly well. And both also that fact and the, the fact that they did go the extra, you know, little step there to add in ray tracing. Yes, it is only limited to the essentially visual appreciation modes, like your replays and your, your Vista modes and things like that. It really does impact the car rendering when you do see them. It's about like getting that driver experience in there. And it looks really, really good. I'm really curious to see what they do in the eventuality of there being a PC port of this game, if they do add in uh, ray trace reflections, because I'd love to see them in, in gameplay too, based upon what they did with those replays. Uh, but even without them, the game, it looks really, really good. And, you know, improves definitely on sport for sure. Yeah. And that's why I think it made the list. Mm -hmm. You know, there are some arguments that some of the environments are less impressive. I think some of the stuff inherited from sport, it still looks nice in terms of lighting, but the new tracks definitely steal the show in terms of overall detail quality. And they are scaled up nicely on PS5. Uh, there's a lot more detail on like the deep forest raceway in the PS5 version. It's just missing like acres of trees on PS4, which is funny. Uh, but at the same time, you know, some of these environments, it's never going to look like uh, one of the more fantastical racing games because it's based on tracks. Yeah. Right? And fundamentally, realistic racetracks can only look so beautiful. <laughs> and I think the, the what they've chosen to focus on is the lighting in that sense mm -hmm. and that's where it really stands out yeah. so it's not ray traced lighting but the way they do their global illumination and time of day cycling is is actually very effective but i think they've sort of studied a lot of like the way light behaves and baked out all the different iterations of that and smoothly interpolate between them to great effect so uh, i think it works pretty darn well yeah awesome looking title but I think with that, John, what do you think? Should we go on to uh, three, two, and one here? Our, our In top just three? a second, Alex, because oh, first oh. we have a surprise. Oh no! Uh, this is the bonus one, <laughs> and I need you to—I need you to vote on this one, Alex. All right, are you ready? Okay. We've got to decide on the best of the West because 2022 was the year of the West with games such as Evil West, Hard West Two, and Weird West. So, Alex, tell me. Which is the best of the West? Man, John, the choices. So many Western games with the word West in their name. Yes. West, West, West. Well, here, John, I'm a, I'm a lover. I'm not a hater. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to go with Weird West because I'm a weird guy. Right. I'm a weird guy, and I like weird things. All right. Well, I think that's a fair description. <laughs> so Weird West wins the bonus category. <laughs> but now it's time to get serious. We're moving on to the top three. These are ordered. Um, and we're starting with number three. And that one. It's Portal RTX. Yes. Alex, why did we put Portal RTX in the third slot? Uh, well, so there's a lot to be said about the power of lighting <laughs> uh mm. i've typed online if you follow me online i've typed online before that the most important thing to a game beyond you know like animation uh really is just kind of how lighting is achieved because it's more important than geometric detail in my opinion it's more important than a lot of things uh because if something doesn't look right that little part of your brain that is constantly interacting with the real world goes Hmm. This looks like a video game. <laughs> yep. And uh, that is, you know, it's immersion breaking, but also there's a lot of fun in light. Light is dynamic and interactive in the real world. And video games for the longest period of time to propel visual realism have made it very static. And ray tracing and path tracing, which is what Portal RTX uses, just says, have fun. Everything's dynamic right now. And it has a great effect on the game world in Portal, a game that wasn't even designed around it uh, because it's using, you know, RTX Remix to inject this uh, really awesome path trace renderer into the old one. And when you put the side-by-sides up there that I did in my video covering this game, you realize, I think, in spite of any objections you may have about, you know, little things about art, that this is an incredibly transformative you know, change to the game. And it does, I honestly think, make it look a lot, lot better. There's so many moments when I was just playing the game. It's like a, 
I think it's like a one and a half hour long game. I I could probably even beat it quicker because I already know it. I've, I could probably sure, beat sure. it like within an, <laughs> less than an hour if I really tried. Um, but, you know, I spent more than three hours in the game. Uh, e I would have done that even if I wasn't making a video on it, just because I was examining the way light interacted with the environment and the really cool stuff that it does and just how much like it's like there's little things that you just expect like to do and it does them the portal rtx and it just kind of like activates that little part of your brain that goes wow this is cool and that's one of my favorite yeah. parts about video games i just like going into a world being immersed into it and then i've so all of a sudden like a couple hours later i find myself wandering around looking at as rich would joke a toilet um <laughs> you know like i just love it you when did. i look at yep. things that's the heaven we do three halo combat evolved crisis and you know portal rtx as well too yeah i can agree with that walking into a room and you just uh press your face against the glass and you see the distortions through the glass <laughs> yeah. realistically transferred yeah, yeah, yeah. and then those little energy pellets bouncing around perfectly casting shadows and you know reflecting off the surfaces whether uh, glossy or uh you know yeah rougher it's just it's it's such a wonderful experience from a visual perspective it's, it's captivating that there was one moment that i didn't even put in my video but it made me laugh because it's totally dynamic where you go into like uh some like air pipes that are shooting around all the cubes around the environment and they're transparent <laughs> and when you go in them they're like shooting around with the air and it's like bringing you to different places right. in this place whatever uh, but at one point, it like stops and it shoves Shell, the main character, against the side of the pipe. And in that moment, in the RTX version, the Portal RTX version, I could see Shell's face reflected like Samus Aran style <laughs> in the pipe in front of me. And I just like, it was like subconscious and I laughed. I was like, that is so funny that they even, you know, that's part of the game. But it just happens dynamically. It's not like they had to code that in yep, there or yep. something like that. Uh, so and that's so fun. not even getting to just the the promise of RTX Remix itself and what that potentially brings to the table. We've seen a lot of experiments, very early stuff, but uh, I am super excited to see where this goes in the future. And yeah. just from an overall technical perspective and in terms of visual beauty, uh, due in part to the strong art direction of the original, but also uh, light speeds work on you know refreshing the assets, the assets and the more way physically plausible. <laughs> uh, yeah, it really it's a huge difference. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just a phenomenal piece of work. Yeah. Just a truly exceptional, beautiful game if you have the hardware to run it. And I think more people might than they would think yeah. if you follow Alex's recommended settings, then you should definitely give it a look because it's also free if you own Portal on the PC right now. So yeah, I know. Like, this is you the. You can't go wrong. So many free updates this year, but that was one of the better ones. That's why it's number three on this list. Uh, but number two, though, number two. This is, this is a game that could have taken a top slot, but unfortunately it launched with some technical issues. Yet, despite that, the quality of the work was of such a high quality that we felt that it still needed to be on the list. And Alex, this is the second Unreal Engine game, the second and final Unreal Engine game. Yep, it list. is. Yep. It's, if you couldn't guess already, the, the Callisto, Callisto Protocol. Protocol. So, John, you covered this in full in a video looking primarily at the um, PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X version. I looked at it right. a bit on PC, which is a completely different story. But I think what you oh. showed off very well is how Unreal is a set of tools. <laughs> and yes, uh, within the hands of a very <laughs> uh, technically astute people, they can make it into their own thing. And they can really push it super far. And... This title just has it everywhere in every single aspect of the visual rendering paradigm but to the point where I would say, like, if you just showed me footage of this game, I don't think I would point out it as being Unreal Engine 4 base, which is, I think That's is right. a very powerful statement. <laughs> yeah. It, it also uh, really focuses on utilizing ray tracing to enhance the presentation in a way that surprised me. Now, this is a cross-gen game, believe it or not. Uh, but when you actually look at those older versions, you can kind of see how it feels like a game that was built with ray tracing in mind, specifically the reflections and the shadows. Right. Because the the entire world is just filled out more when you enable these features. Uh, the way that you have surprisingly diffuse reflections on consoles, for instance, is something we've very, very rarely seen, but they are here. 
uh, the additional shadows you get where everything is properly shadowed when using the ray tracing feature. That makes a big difference. I mean, this is basically like, you could say, this feels like the modern take on the type of environments that Doom 3 presented. Yeah, it is, Way really. back in the day, right? There's a lot of similarities there. I kept thinking, man, that looks like a Doom 3 door. This feels <laughs> like like that part when you walk down into the dungeon, you know, welcome to the dungeon marine, mm -hmm. the loneliest place on Mars. You, <laughs> you really get that feeling uh, in this game. Uh, plus all the volumetrics, the weather effects, like this snowstorm when you end up outside, uh, the motion blur. Particles, like particles motion blur with motion blur as particles. well, too. Oh, I love yeah. particle motion blur, man. But then, you know, this is this studio. This is a studio formed by very experienced people, of course, but what they did with the performance capture in the the rendering quality on the characters is uh pretty unbelievable like they had some big name actor actors in this you know sam Witwer's in there of course heck yeah and others just the way they emote the facial expressions everything it's perfectly captured from the actors and their likenesses in a way that feels so natural and like realistic that it just kind of I don't know. You mentioned this with The Last of Us, and I think this goes even further, where it just feels like you're watching a performance rather than like a, a game cutscene. You know what I mean? Yeah, it was really well done, incredibly well done. Um, some, you know, you already talked about a lot of the asset detail and stuff too, but I guess we should probably say a little bit why it wasn't number one, and that is because Which it could have been. It could have been. It really could have been. Um, but we are trying to also take into account visual fluidity and you know yeah. like on launch and ease and even to this day uh depending upon your platform is not the most visually smooth experience uh necessarily no. uh and you know we really want to you know like when we're talking about graphics they have to animate in a way that is like consistent and generally enjoyable to look at and if it doesn't do that it actually does take away from the presentation in spite of how good the graphics may look in a screenshot exactly uh, so this is all so... about moving graphics so that's probably why it wasn't there Still, the fact that it's number two does speak volumes about what they did accomplish. Yes, and right. I think it's definitely well-deserved. Striking Distance, you guys did an amazing work this year and uh, produced our second best-looking game of 2022. Yeah. So congratulations on that. Congratulations. Well done. Well done. Uh, but the final game, the number one pick, this is the one that took a little bit of time to arrive at. But when actually looking back at the game again, playing parts of it, checking out the video I did on it... Uh, it sort of reminded me that, oh yeah, these guys did, did really exceptional work and deserve the acclaim. I'm talking about Horizon Forbidden West. So this was another John joint, another John project. I haven't played the game really yet. Uh, all, you all, will when I, it comes to PC. <laughs> well, when it PC, when it comes to PC. But um, <laughs> kind of like with uh, The Witcher oh, that we talked about in the beginning where we mentioned oh, it really solved a lot of the issues that the original release had. Well, Horizon Forbidden West, to me, from my visual perspective, having played the PC version as well as on PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5, um, Forbidden West looks to almost solve every single, mi the, I say minor gripe, but gripe that you had there with the original yeah. title. When you go back and watch your original uh, Her uh, Horizon Zero Dawn video, you like pointed out things that you were like, you know, this, this doesn't look too great. And then you go to the the sequel here and it's like <laughs> they went overboard almost to make the things really that, did. that you complained about look way better uh john yeah. I, talk about some of those things they made way better man they did so a lot. for for starters you know the character rendering it's rendering itself is significantly better but that was already i guess it was pretty good for the time but they looked a little bit more like i don't know wax figures in the first game this time though the character rendering quality is so high like it's very impressive, but the big difference comes from the way conversations are handled. Animation was pretty lackluster in the first game. I feel there was a lot of those like one-on-one -on -one conversations between Al Aloy and the NPCs, and it's never look. It's very robotic. Uh, this time, though, it really genuinely moves and looks like a real person might now. Like you really feel the just the body language and the facial expressions and all the little doodads that they're wearing and they wear a lot of them uh <laughs> it all just sort of moves very naturally now in a way that kind of took me by surprise and it makes the conversations themselves more engaging because it actually feels like you're 
talking to a character instead of like a lifeless dummy basically but then on, they also built upon uh well the world itself is, is so stupidly detailed now in a way that's really interesting because it's very scalable because this was cross-gen they shipped it on ps4 uh, but they scaled it up so beautifully on ps5 with just massively pushing out the amount of granular detail per scene and the draw distance itself but then the lighting this was uh there was a ton of light leak in the original uh game you know they they also did time of day changes they had multiple pre-calculated baked lighting models for for the environment but then they would try to interpolate between it but there wasn't necessarily enough bakes to handle all scenarios so you'd have a lot of spaces that felt improperly lit or just a little bit off and your eye would notice this and it was very common for the day that has improved so much it just feels uh it's 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 just very visually pleasing now you know and there's some nice bounce lighting that you get from it as well that's uh you didn't really see in the original um oh and just two other things that they improved the grass, for instance, in the first game, most of it did not interact with, there was no collision with your character, no animation outside of the stealth grass, but most of the grass, nothing. This one, they actually went so far with the, with the grass interactions that everything leaves trails now. Even little animals scurrying around, they actually mat down the grass and leave a trail behind them. Uh, it's so well done now, it looks beautiful. Then there's the the water. The water in general is a huge achievement this time because it was not very good in the original. They use these sort of very generic low res cube maps combined with uh, pretty mediocre SSR at mediocre that point. Mediocre SSR. Yeah. Now they're doing this sort of real time cube map calculations, if you recall, where it's kind of constantly taking an image of the scene from the perspective of the camera and sort of uh, ensuring that those line up well with the reflections. And then they're combining that with massively improved screen space reflections, which look gorgeous. And on top of that, you've got all the, the pre-calculated sort of animation work they did for like the waves, like that wave sort of simulation ish stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. Like the cresting waves specifically. Uh, if you stop and look at that stuff and the little foam layer on top and the way it sort of, oh man falls over itself it's so good it's very, right it's very well done and they didn't need to but you know they also improved like sky rendering on um, the playstation 5 version for example they like scale it up they made it more uh, capable of doing more dynamic skies for example the original game you know it could only update so much to get it looking good there on playstation 4 right and, and it just amped cost. it up that huge cost and all these little things add up and i one thing that's really praiseworthy in the year of cross-gen where we saw so much cross-gen stuff is once again that they actually focused on like giving the PlayStation 5 version like really, really visible and palpable differences, which were shown off really well in your video. And was something that we also really didn't expect, I would say, yeah. uh, regarding, because, you know, like across the industry, it was pretty easy just to like pump up the resolution and things like that and, you know, give a 60 FPS mode. Um, but here it was like, oh, you put them side by side and it was like, yeah, that's a very compromised PS4 version that runs and looks fine in its own right, given the hardware. But it was like, yeah, this is a PS5 game actually in a lot of ways. So that for was sure, really cool to see. Sure. Yeah. I'm just looking at this stuff again, just the level of detail on just things like the leaves and the little like clovers and flowers and everything scattered about. I mean, you can zoom the camera all the way into that stuff and it, it holds up. It's just unbelievable. But to be fair, it did launch with some people had some complaints about image quality and they responded and actually fixed it entirely by changing the way their AA works. Yeah. Right. Uh, and that's <laughs> now much better as well. So yeah. Uh, Very I responsive mean, it, uh, developers. We didn't even part. mention stuff like uh, the, the sort of relief mapping they did or the excellent, the terrain deformation which is used for sand and snow in this, and it's improved over over what they did with the frozen wilds. So there's that as well. And, you know, I already mentioned the water, but another aspect of the water that I think is important is that there's different types of water. You don't think about this, but there's like babbling brooks, there's, there's lakes, there's more oceans, there's uh, sort of rocky mountains with like waterfalls and water sort of carving around that. There's little trickles through the forest. Every single type of instance where water is used actually looks suitably different.
different from the rest. Like it behaves more as you would expect water to behave. It feels like they took the critiques against things like that personally. And they're like, we're going to do everything we can <laughs> to ensure that these things so that are John Littleman so doesn't much make a video complaining about our water again. <laughs> Uh, that that was it. That's the only reason why. That's it, man. <laughs> oh, it's, well, just what a beautiful game. What a beautiful yeah, game. Well and done. I feel like this is a game that was annoyingly to, uh, kind of overshadowed earlier in the year. I mean, Elden Ring kind of came out and stole its thunder, and Elden Ring is unbelievable. <laughs> what a game. Uh, but not a game from a technical perspective. Elden Ring is not. <laughs> that does not look great. <laughs> but Forbidden West, yeah. Just, just a stunning achievement from Guerrilla Games. And it really shows that they've learned a lot. And uh, yeah, plus this is their own technology again. It's Decima still flexing on us. And, uh, you know, it's, wow, what can I say? Great work on this. And it's a well-deserved number one for the team at Guerrilla. So congrats. Yeah, I can't wait to see what they make next because they're probably going to sequelize this again, given the success yeah, of it all. That, yeah. We know that. Uh, but I'm also curious to see, you know, there's like rumors of them making a co-op game. Uh, there's also, I would hope that they return to a, like a linear single player adventure game at some point in time. I mean, they did kill zone, but what about like, imagine the detail you could do with this engine in a first person game because first person I games know. require like so much detail. They technically require quite a bit more than a third person game due to the camera height difference. Um, wow. What would they do there? I want to see it. <laughs> I don't know. I would I would love to see this as well. And hopefully someday we will. I suspect they won't be returning to Killzone anytime soon because critically speaking, Horizon has done a lot better for them. <laughs> I would say I'm always going to be a defender of Killzone Shadowfall. I think it's criminally underrated. Uh, I see why people were frustrated with it, but I think it's a cool game. Yeah, but yeah. still. Maybe so, next yeah, time. That's... Uh, that's the graphics of the year from us. Uh -huh. I think, uh, is there anything else you wanted to say to finish off this year? No, it's, it's been a year. This was a hard year at DF for our work because I think you can test this, Sean, that games launched super hot and, or, yeah. or, or the, the pre-launch yeah, period right up until launch was like, why are you sending us this code? The game's barely working. <laughs> the kind of thing. It was that kind of year. So. For those titles that did launch in a polished and enjoyable state, like um, like I would consider Horizon, one of those that launched in a polished and enjoyable state, uh, thank you for doing that. It made our lives yeah. better, and it also yeah. made, presumably, the people playing the game when it launched. Well, I guess to be fair, better. Horizon had a few... Yeah. It had some issues at launch, but nothing... I wouldn't say it was as severe as most of the other as stuff. As most of the stuff year. we saw was, this year, no. It was little polish issues here and there, and they've they've tightened all that stuff up. It was kind of a, I'd say it's similar to Dying Light 2's kind of launch, where it's like, yeah, it's pretty good. But not they, perfect, but know. pretty good. I, I would like that, though. <laughs> it's not a broken. Yeah. <laughs> Compared to all the other stuff we've seen lately, oh my goodness. Oh um, my gosh. Ooh. But, you know, I feel... For, I, it's obviously, it's been a difficult couple of years in yeah. development studios. And I think a lot of them had to adapt and just figure out ways to get stuff shipped. And it was obviously very, very challenging from that perspective. And yeah. uh, hopefully 2023 is better for everyone. I hope so. And My goodness. Based on the list of stuff that's supposed to come out, I think we're going to have some real bangers next year, as they say, <laughs> uh, from a visual perspective. And I think yeah. the cross-gen period is finally about to come to an end or slow way down. So we'll see how that goes at the time. But I think that's going to do it for this video. So uh, thank you for joining me on this journey, Alex. Yeah, it was wonderful, John. And this is definitely not the second time we've recorded this. <laughs> <laughs> indeed uh but i also want to say thank you to the rest of the df team you know uh richard tom will oliver of course you guys are awesome and help make this a great year and uh we'll see you in 2023